Hello, everyone. My name is Reese Lindmark, and you're listening to Gray Mirror, a podcast from MIT Media Lab's Digital Currency Initiative on technology, society, and ethics. And unlike something like Black Mirror, which just looks at the negative impacts of technology on society, we are Gray Mirror, so we look at the positive and negative impacts of technology on society. And please, if you have any feedback, reach out on Twitter. And if you like the show, give us a five-star rating on your favorite podcast app. Uh, We really do appreciate it. Thanks. So today I interview Marshall Gans, who is a Harvard professor, but he's actually most famous for leading political organizing with Obama in 2008, the United Farm Workers with Cesar Chavez and Dolores Huerta in the you know late 1900s, <laughs> uh, and a variety of other kind of organizing, political organizing things. So in today's episode, I mean, A, I really, really enjoyed how much Marshall emphasizes emotions and narrative as a part of building movements. And it's a part of just connecting to people more generally. And especially this is kind of a breath of fresh air coming from the more hyper-tech world. And even this podcast, which often comes less, uh, you know, from the emotions and narrative side and more from the mental kind of system side. So that was really great. And another piece of that that's very aligned is that I asked, you know, Marshall has this framework of the story of self, the story of us, and the story of now. And so I asked Marshall to answer those questions about himself. And so that's just very nice to get uh, deeper into his own background and to understand more of how he thinks about the world and why he is who he is today. And then finally, of course, uh, we also chat about how tech has changed organizing more generally. And Marshall, again, kind of brings his kind of human perspective towards this and really emphasizes the significance of relationality uh, to building collective capacity and how tech doesn't really enable that at all. And instead of enabling it, we're actually instrumentalized by it uh, instead of being empowered by it. So it's <laughs> it's kind of a, a sad take, but it's... Uh, you know, part of maybe the fun take about it is we also explore crypto at the end um, as a form of maybe network nonviolent protests. So this is to say, it's it's a really nice um, episode today with, with Marshall. I'll do a longer reflection at the end of the episode if you want to listen to it there, but really enjoy today's episode uh, and, and get to feel Marshall's warmth uh, come through your ears. Okay, thanks and goodbye. Hello, everyone. You're listening to Gray Mirror. And today, I'm super excited to interview Marshall Gans. Uh, And we're in person, which is always fun looking at each other on the desk. Um, And so, Marshall, thanks so much for being on the show and welcome. No, glad to be here. Yeah, excited to dive in. And I think we're going to chat a lot about Marshall's kind of um, history and background with organizing, uh, community organizing. But before we do that, you have this interesting concept of the story of self, the story of us, and the story of now. Could you kind of explain to our listeners, like, what those are and then what your answers for them would be in today, you know? Well, no, that's very well put. I mean, basically, um, in teaching organizing, we teach it as a form of leadership. And it's rooted in three questions posed by the first century Jerusalem scholar Rabbi Hillel, who, when asked, um, how do I figure out what to do with my life, responded with three questions. The first, to ask yourself if I am not for myself, will be for me. It's not meant to be selfish. It is meant to be Mm self-regarding. Like if you presume to uh, accept leadership with respect to others, you better be clear about your own values, what you bring to it, what's for. It's kind of a demand for self-awareness and self-appreciation, I think. Then the second question, though, is if I am for myself alone, or when I am for myself alone, what am I? Mm. Meaning to be a who a human being and not a what a thing is to recognize our inherent relationality. I mean, our our capacity to realize our objectives is inextricably wrapped up the capacity of others to realize theirs. We are relational creatures. And finally, he says, ask yourself, if not now, when? Not advice to jump into moving traffic, but a caution against what Jane Adams called the snare of preparation. Mm -hmm. You know, just another year of strategic planning, we'll have the perfect plan, and then we'll act, and the world will totally conform to our expectations, which it never does. And so, for me, leadership's about the interaction of these three elements of self, Mm -hmm. with others, with action, Mm -hmm. and how they hang together. Mm -hmm. The fact they're questions is also important, because Uh, If you think about what the domain of leadership is, um, rarely has it been people's experience that when everything is going really well in their organization, people say, where's the leadership so we can Mm -hmm. thank them? Usually when people say, who's in charge here? 
when do they say it? <laughs> when the bad things are happening, yeah, the uncertainty. The, yeah. the, 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 it's challenging. And so it's sort of to actually understand that accepting a role for leadership is not about some ideal state of control, but it's rather like, like dealing with the challenging and the unexpected and the problematic. That is, in other words, if you have a, a good system set up, that's great. That doesn't take leadership. Leadership is adaptive and creative and able to deal with these kinds of, that's the whole point. And so that's also pretty challenging because you ask yourself, do I have the skills to deal with this new stuff? And that's a challenge to the hands. Um, can I use my resources in new ways? And that's a strategic challenge, a challenge to the head. And then there's, uh, where do I get the courage? Where do I get the hope? How do I inspire the hope and courage in others to take the risks that are often involved in dealing with serious challenges? Mm -hmm. And that's a challenge to the heart. Mm -hmm. So it's thinking of leadership in a head, hands, heart kind of way. Mm -hmm. And so for me, the definition then is, uh, that I use is leadership is about accepting responsibility because there is a choice for enabling others to achieve shared purpose. So this is not a diva model of leadership under conditions of uncertainty. Mm. Except responsibility enabling others to achieve shared purpose under conditions of uncertainty. Mm. And so it's not, then it, it is, approaching leadership that way makes it more of a practice you know, than a position. Yeah. Uh, we certainly have all had experience with people who occupy positions of formal leadership, but turn out to be pretty awful leaders, <laughs> like like every day. Mm -hmm. We get to experience that. Yeah. On the other hand, uh, we meet people in workplaces and schools and neighborhoods who are exercising leadership in the way I'm describing it uh, all, all the time. Mm -hmm. uh, and so understanding it to be a practice. The other is that it's a lot more about learning than knowing mm -hmm. because you can't know all the answers. Nobody can. The future is indeterminate. And so it's the capacity to ask questions that reveal answers, that reveal pathways that's really fundamental here. Mm -hmm. So, you know, narrative is one of the ways we've learned to access the uh, emotional resources embedded in our values to learn how to res how to um, replace reacting in fear to the unexpected or to the threatening mm -hmm. by turning it into a ch challenge to which we can respond. Mm -hmm. in, a, in other words, turning turning threats from which we must flee mm -hmm. into knowledge into challenges that we with which we can engage. Yeah. And and the elements there are about on the one hand sometimes um, being able to articulate the nature of a challenge profoundly to people who are stuck in habit or business as usual um, and that that is an emotional piece of work or to develop the emotional capacity to respond with hope over fear with with solidarity or love over alienation with a sense of self-worth as opposed to self-doubt. Mm -hmm. So there is an emotional agenda uh, necessary for the exercise of agency. Mm -hmm. And we think of agency primarily in cognitive terms, but without the emotional capacity, we're reactive. Mm -hmm. And so, it, but, but it also means understanding that values, the content of values is, is emotion. It's how we feel about things. Mm -hmm. it's like. St. Augustine said, it's one thing to know the good, another to love it. Loving it is what enables action upon mm -hmm. it. And so emotion, motivation, movement, that's the whole other side. Mm -hmm. We can work on the cognitive side to answer the question, how do I do it? But to answer the question, why do I care? Why should anybody care? We've got to work on the emotional side. It's, it's accepting that there is such a thing as a language of emotion, mm -hmm. yep. just as there is a language of cognition. Yep. Yep. We tend to dismiss emotion and treat it as something that gets in the way. Well, then our humanity gets in the way because we are emotional and cognitive creatures. And so it's, um, it, it, it's like um, Pascal said, that you, the heart has reason of which reason does not know. And we all know emotional language. Music speaks a language of emotion yeah. without yeah. words. Yeah. Worship, uh, theater, poetry, prayer, song. And 
So the domain of narrative is in that domain, mm -hmm. dealing with challenges and emotional in content. So the, the core elements then of narrative are a plot, a character, and a moral. Mm -hmm. What happens in a plot is someone's going along on their way somewhere, and then something crazy happens. <laughs> and at that point is when we pay attention, uh, because, oh, well, what? And then we get curious, and then we sort of have to ask ourselves, why is that so provocative? You know, why is it boring up to that point? <laughs> I think the reflection is that that having to cope with the unexpected, the unpredictable, the uncertain, is a core dimension of human consciousness. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if you sort of think about, you know, how many times a day do un unexpected things happen to you, little things, you know, and then marriages break up and people get thrown out of school, lose jobs, we lose loved ones for whom we care that we, we, we by definition, can't be prepared for. So this need to figure out how to uh, how to deal with those with uncertainty, with surprise, in a constructive way that enables agency, as opposed to a reactive way that's rooted in fear. That's kind of what the subject of narrative is, because that's what happens. Mm -hmm. And because we can identify with the protagonist through, we now understand through mirror neurons, we, we can observe the action and experience it. Mm -hmm. The moral we take away from a story is not so much a, you know, a proposition like case makes waste, but rather the actual experience mm -hmm. of mm -hmm. where the fear, yeah. where the hope come from, where the courage, and so that becomes a moral taught not so much to the head as to the heart, and so it is a way of um, of equipping ourselves with the uh, emotional capacity to exercise agency and to enable others to do so. Mm -hmm. Uh, and you know it's why faith traditions and culture, cultures, uh, families. I mean, I'm sure you heard your first stories not from the professional storytellers <laughs> guild, yeah. probably from a parent. <laughs> Eighty-five percent of the time, parents spend with young kids is storytelling, mm -hmm. and it's not. It, it partly is to keep them busy, but actually, if you think about it, it's instructive. Mm -hmm. I mean, people are trying to equip their children with the capacity to be choiceful human beings. Mm -hmm. And so if you say, here's a set of rules, follow these, forget it. Mm -hmm. You tell stories, mm -hmm. and the stories teach the heart, and those become resources for them mm -hmm. when they have to confront mm -hmm. challenges. Mm -hmm. Now what we do in public narrative, and this has been a long way to get around to this, <laughs> what we do in public <laughs> narrative is uh, work with people to discover within their own lives their moments mm -hmm when they learned to care. Mm -hmm. There are moments in when they found hope. Mm -hmm. So that this can become what Charles Taylor calls uh, the articulation of moral sources. Mm -hmm. Because those are inexperiences. And sometimes they're hurtful and sometimes they're hopeful, but by learning to articulate those moments, because moment is the core unit of narrative. It's not, mm -hmm. it's making the past present or the distant immediate. Mm -hmm. By, by accessing those experiences and sharing them with others, we enable others to get us. Mm. Not our resumes, not our, but what, what's moving us, why, mm -hmm. why we care. Uh, and that's the story of self. Mm -hmm. The story of us is using narrative to bring alive value shared mm -hmm. by the community whom we hope to engage. And the story of now is taking the present moment and turning it into a narrative moment mm -hmm by uh, articulating the urgent need for action, uh, sources of hope for that action, and choices we need to make now. Mm -hmm. And one of the best illustrations of the difference between narrative and not narrative was Democratic Convention in, uh, in 2016. If you listen to Michelle Obama, she speaks all in narrative moments. Mm. Uh, the, the cars, the big black cars come to pick up their children uh, guys with guns, she sees their faces pressed up against mm -hmm. the window, she mm -hmm. turns to Barack, what have we done? Mm -hmm. We are with her in that moment. Mm -hmm. And so we're able to get the emotional meaning of the moment and also the person. Mm -hmm. um, Hillary could never tell a single story. Mm -hmm. And so w we don't, 
we don't know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the problem in public life is if you don't take authorship of your own story, others will. Mm -hmm. That's what happened mm -hmm. to John Kerry, that's what happened to Hillary, mm -hmm. and in small ways it happens all over the place all mm -hmm. the time. So my argument is that we need to actually step up and own and author our stories. Yep. And just the last uh, just the last comment, the first time I taught this class, somebody said, oh, this is about how to package ourselves. Mm -hmm. And a woman mm -hmm. from India said, no, this is not about how to apply a gloss from the outside, it's how to bring out the glow from the inside. Mm -hmm. And I think mm -hmm. it, is, it mm -hmm. is empowering authenticity with the skill and the craft to take what we know implicitly, which is storytelling, make it explicit, so we can bring intentionality, purpose, and skill, and teach others as well. Yeah, yeah. I that's I like a lot of what you said there. I think a lot of it's very powerful. I think, and just to reflect some of it, um, I think, yeah, I mean, obviously in our current society, the, I mean, for me, I'll just speak for myself, in 20, 2018, my New Year's resolution was to be more physical, emotional, spiritual, because yeah. I'm super mental. You know, it's yeah. like my mental is where I'm at. It's like, oh, God, I'm <laughs> over-indexed on that. And so it's like making sure they have the other side is super crucial. Of course, crucial. You, you, you are. All those other things. I am. I am trying my best. It, exactly. No, no, but it's there in you because it's in all of us, and so it's more a question of learning the language. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. Um, so I think that that's crucial, and I think that there's a. I think a, a meta note here. I think it's fun as you you talk about things. You're like highlighting. Oh, as Pascal said this, as this rabbi uh -huh. said that. Yeah. That's just kind of a fun thing. And I think that there's. I mean, this big the the final piece at the end of. Of it's not a gla a gloss from the outside in it's you know a shine from the inside glow out you glow from the inside out I think yeah. that's beautiful, and I think that there's I guess my maybe my highest or what what should I or my listeners um, do in order to be able to tell their story of self or to be able to speak emotionally and or with stories with moments in a better way like is there a book that we can read or uh, come, come to a workshop <laughs> <Nice. coughs> no or or we're doing a class online this mm -hmm. this uh, fall mm -hmm. on public narrative mm -hmm. uh, we've been doing an organizing class online for several years mm -hmm. now. But we use Zoom, and mm -hmm. so people are present. They see each other. Mm -hmm. We build a, an online learning community. Mm -hmm. and we build relationships. I mean, in the organizing class, we had 150 people from uh, 25 countries yeah. and a teaching team from all over the place because mm -hmm. everybody meets together, and then they meet in sections. They get coaching mm -hmm. from a TF. They learn to coach each other. So it, it, the, the challenge with it is you can read a book about it, yeah. But you can read a book about riding a bicycle, mm -hmm. and what do you know? Mm -hmm. uh, not much when it comes to riding a bicycle. Mm -hmm. So the pedagogy we use is what we, what we describe as uh, explain mm -hmm. the theoretical dimension, uh, model, see how it works, and then do it, yeah. and then debrief. Yeah. Yep. And it's sort of get on the bike, and you're going to fall. Mm -hmm. It's the only way you can learn to keep your balance. Mm -hmm. And so then the question is, what kind of scaffolding helps? And you know, we've done some stuff with the for the resistance school here, where we put together a whole set of modules on coaching and how to coach, how to coach public narrative, because we teach the coaching along with the telling, mm -hmm. because it, it, it's hard to do this without an interlocutor. Yeah. The reason being that there's a Yiddish riddle um, who discovered water, mm -hmm. and the answer is I don't know. But it wasn't a fish. It's supposed to be funny. <laughs> yeah. But the point is, we're all fish in the water of our own stories. Yeah. So someone asking us the questions, mm -hmm. someone curious and probing, mm -hmm. not because they're genuinely interested. Mm -hmm. Boy, that's that's a powerful way of learning, mm -hmm. and it gets us across the emotional barriers to taking the risks involved in this kind of learning. Mm -hmm. So you know. Um, it, yeah, you can read a book about it, <laughs> and you can watch a video about it, but, you know... Doing it, yeah. Doing it, mm -hmm. and, and the way we teach it is we always have <coughs> coaching small groups, <coughs> so out of every out of every workshop comes people who can coach. So it's a cascade model, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and that's what, that's what it has enabled us to... It to be, re I was in, uh, <coughs> I was in Greece and in Jordan last week, mm -hmm. and in Jordan, uh, boy, this has taken root there, yeah. because they have their own storytelling tradition, the Hakalati, mm -hmm. but you know it's grounding it in people's experience, and so now a lot of people have learned how to do this mm -hmm. um, in a very distinct culture, mm -hmm. 
in Greece, we re I met a guy who was trying to teach public narrative who works for the government in adult development. It was, and, you know, we had never met. So we spent about three hours on how to make it experiential. Mm -hmm. So that's that's how it works. Yep, yep. And I think uh, so. So I, a, I'll, I'll put a link to the, the your the yeah, online cool. class in the yeah. show notes. And B, I guess googling public narrative is the other way. And then I, I guess I want to um, also the water piece. There's that also that good. I haven't heard that Yiddish um, uh, <laughs> parable or, or or riddle before. But uh, there's the David uh, Foster Wallace one as well, which is like that. We're yeah, we're uh, from a paradigm perspective, the 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 water that we live in. Yeah. Where the fish says to the other fish, "What are what is water?" What is yeah, water? Exactly, no, no, exactly. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. No, and that's why the coaching thing. Mm -hmm. That's why it's an inherently relational and interdependent yeah. kind of thing. Yeah. Um, I also like, by the way, that it's a cascade bottle in that. It, yeah. and that's the nice thing with these bottom-up things, is that like by nature, they kind of repeat themselves in this weird viral way. Yeah. Um, so I guess for you, what is your story of self and us and uh, uh, now? <laughs> how much time you got? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. No, I mean... <laughs> you no, have 12 I'm, seconds for yeah. each. No, no, no. <laughs> no, no, no. no, I mean, you know, basically, I... I um, we moved around a lot. My father was a rabbi, my mother a teacher. Uh, we settled eventually in Bakersfield, California. And so, you know, from uh, there were sort of two things there. One is, um, I grew up in narrative. I mean, in the Jewish tradition, you're connected much more to the story than the place. Mm -hmm. Because it's a, it's a diaspora tradition, and so all the holidays are chapters in the story. Um, and, you know, I like the Passover story, but everyone's the story. So it's like Abraham was your grandfather or something. It's very... But also, we always lived in communities where there were very small Jewish communities, and there was a sense of marginalization. Mm -hmm. uh, we lived in, in Germany for three years after the war. He was working with as a chaplain with Holocaust survivors, and my fifth birthday party was in a... It was a children's camp which at first I thought was cool mm -hmm. until I realized why it was a children's camp because mm -hmm. the parents had all yeah. were all gone. Yeah. And so these realities of both the sort of meaning of narrative but also kind of insights about the meaning of inside, outside mm -hmm. and you know mm -hmm. the sort of the dark side of life as well as the, the, the joyful side. Mm -hmm. And um, when I finished high school I just wanted to come as far away from Bakersfield, well, this was in Bakersfield, California. It's an oil and agriculture mm -hmm. town. John Steinbeck made it infamous in Grapes of Wrath. Mm -hmm. uh, and I came to school here as an undergrad, and here got involved in civil rights work, which was just beginning then. And so then volunteered for the Mississippi Summer Project in 1964. And that's really where I discovered what would be a calling that, mm -hmm. that First of all, it was it was challenging things that I really believed needed challenge, like institutionalized racism in this country, which was because my parents taught me about the Holocaust not as being simply about anti-Semitism, but about racism. That racism kills, and we were fighting that. Mm -hmm. Growing up on those Passover stories, you sort of, you know, are you with the guys with the chariots, or are you with the people trying to find their mm -hmm. way to a land of promise? Civil rights movement spoke that as well, and and. You know, I'd never had the experience of going up to someone twice my age who would stand up, offer me his chair, call me Mr., introduce himself with his first name, not look me in the eye because he was black and I was white, and that was thousands of times across the South every day. Mm -hmm. So the combination of this kind of cultural and political and economic kind of marginalization helped me understand that this problem did not get solved without power and how to enable people to build power from their own resources mm -hmm. became the heart of the matter. And in Montgomery, in the bus boycott, they discovered, the community discovered that they all had a resource they didn't realize was a resource, which was their feet. And if they used their feet to walk to work instead of getting on the bus, they would turn individual dependency on the bus company into the bus company's dependency on a collective community. Mm -hmm. The transformation then of individual resource to collective power was really, really interesting mm -hmm. to me. And, you know, the civil rights movement was lived within the Christian narrative, the biblical narrative, the American narrative. I mean, that's where the energy and the courage and the solidarity all came from, going to like going to church, like the, the, the mass meetings. And uh, when I left and went to work with a farmer who's in California um, for the next 16 years, uh, 
here we were in another community in which um, it was all about, it was a religious narrative, it was also a cultural narrative, it was about, you know, Mexico and all, mm -hmm. again, there were all these narrative sources that were really critical for solidarity and courage and all the rest. And, you know, you know I left the farm workers, I did 10 years, another 10 years of union initial electoral work, mostly in California, and that's when I came back here uh, for my 25th, anniversary, 25th reunion <laughs> nice. and figured out to come back and finish my senior year and graduated close 64-92. I then did a PhD in sociology and got to work on strategy, again realizing that motivation is a critical piece. Mm -hmm. So when I started teaching here at the Kennedy School, I wanted to focus with intentionality on, on the motivational side because when I was at the farm workers, we would always have a story, a strategy, and a structure. Mm. And so the story was the why, the strategy was the how, and the structure was how do we organize ourselves, organize ourselves to do it. Mm -hmm. So then I dove into this narrative stuff, trying to figure out how to teach it. Mm -hmm. And that led to the, it was a, a combination of things uh, where this public narrative stuff came together, which was uh, a project we were doing with Sierra Club where we experimented with it, a commitment I made to teach a course on it here, uh, and the Obama campaign. They all sort of came around the same time. Mm -hmm. And that's that's really how I learned about that stuff. And putting it in a broader context of organizing. Mm -hmm. Because for me, narrative is one piece of the three-legged stool I just described. Mm -hmm. And expecting narrative in itself to change the world Mm -hmm. misses the significance of economic power and political power mm -hmm. which are are critical to actually trying to make structural change yeah. so it has a critical role in a broader process of of organizing and social change yep yep yeah, it's uh, it's cool. To, it's funny how everybody just like you have your path. You know, you you were uh, socialized as a kid in these various ways, and then you kind of learned, um, you know, based you know for you growing up in Germany and and these different stories, and then how that just kind of led from one thing to another. And before you know it, like you're like, oh, I guess I'm a, a person, an expert in you know organizing who um, it likes to teach about you know storytelling and narrative. And well, I, the part that appealed to me the most in organizing was always the leadership development work. Mm -hmm. It was always working with people uh, sort of I found that I could develop my own sense of agency by developing the agency of others yeah. because I was working in communities that were not my communities I was the outsider yeah. you know and and so how, figuring out how to make that productive mm -hmm. turned out like well you focus on on development mm -hmm. and so in a sense that's what I do now yeah. with students it's not that different mm -hmm. but you know when people sort of say, oh, I've got a 30-year plan, so what What do you, you know, life makes a mockery of that. <laughs> you know, it's sort of, what do I feel called to do now? Yeah. Yeah. I think is how this, because this was never a plan. Yeah. I'm just, I never thought I'd be teaching here. Yeah. I, you know, but it's not just random either. Mm -hmm. It's choices that we make that are informed about what we care about. And the more we listen to that, to listen to our hearts, I think the better the choices are. Yeah, yeah, so. yeah. yeah. I think um, it's always good, yeah, to loop back the heart and in, into the decision making process. So I think for me, I want to kind of transition. Thank you for sharing your your, yeah, your, your yeah. story, and I think I um, to transition a little bit into more of perhaps the mental side to some yeah, extent yeah. is um, thinking about. Um, like how organizing has changed over, as you said um, earlier, you you both um, uh, organized with uh, the what was the name of the Mississippi? Well, the Civil Rights Movement. Yeah. It was the Mississippi Summer Project. Mississippi Summer Project, and then you were for sixteen years with the, um, farm, the workers. farm workers um, with uh, Dolores Huerta and uh, Cesar, Cesar Chavez, Chavez, and then um, yeah, as you said with uh, Obama, the Obama campaign in two thousand eight. Um, so over that time period, lots of like the the world around us, the, the technological world has changed, whether it was microwaves or, you know, uh, phones or, or the internet. Tell me how, like, over time, what some of, like, the biggest changes that you've seen in, in how those changes have kind of affected uh, the organizing that has happened? Well, it's a great question. I mean, um, I think that, um, well, just to step back for a moment, I think yeah. in the U.S. in particular, um, 
we're sort of beset with a set of electoral institutions that are profoundly anti-democratic, and they were designed that way. And so it's been very difficult for change to emerge from within those institutions. Social movements going all the way back to the American Revolution itself, but certainly the temperance movement, the abolition movement, so forth, have been a critical mechanism of change in this country because we couldn't do it yeah. that way. And we don't have, cons we used to have, but we don't have constituency parties like they do in, in Canada or in other parts of the world. So movements have had a particular significance. Mm. And, you know, movements are kind of about what I was describing. I mean, they're, they have a strong cultural and emotional content. They're also purposeful. They're intentional. They're strategic. They're sometimes raggledy. There are organizations <laughs> involved in them. So um, I'm just sort of saying that as context because in organizing politically, it used to be that politics was distinguishable from the marketplace in that it was about engaging people with each other. In other words, not selling a product to a customer, not providing a service to a client, although sometimes that was a part of the political process. But essentially, it was about bringing people to engage with one another. And de Tocqueville described it so well when he says that, you know, to be drawn out of our individual narrow self-interest mm -hmm. into what he called you know, enlightened self-interest was really understanding where the common interest lies. Mm -hmm. And you don't get that from a book. You get that with, with engaging with other people from whom, with whom you learn. The same thing with the kind of affective bonds that develop when you work with other people. Mm -hmm. um, that enables solidarity. And the fact that you, if you're working with other people and it's under your own steam, you have to learn to govern yourselves, which is a sort of fundamental democratic practice. Yeah. Now, so organizing has always been about that, in a sense, about building relationships, about then uh, bringing people together around shared narratives, around a shared strategy, around a shared structure, uh, and resulting in forms of strategic action that take place. Now, you know, it used to be that you had to do all that, well, you know, when when the telephone came along, there was a big revolution uh, because, you know, before, well, really, when good, when leaflets came along, when the Bible came, there was a big revolution. So, you know, we've been through these technological changes before, and they're always heralded as being the beginning of a radical new era that history will never be the same and that there are always forces for, the, for good. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, it's a lot more uh, it's a lot more complicated than that, uh, because even though the technologies change, as human beings, we change very little. Yeah. I mean, I don't mean we don't grow and learn; we certainly do. But sort of the core elements about what makes us tick, the significance of relationality, the importance of hope, mm -hmm. the significance of fear, mm -hmm. the need for accountability. These things don't go away. Yeah. I mean, you go go read the story of King David, and you're going to discover a story of power leading to excess, leading to destruction. It's been around for a long time. Yeah. Or read David Goliath. You're going to get a great lesson in strategy. Mm -hmm. So my point is that, that there is change, and there is continuity, and there's also variation. You know, one of the real joys I've had recently is, well, like working in, in the Middle East, uh, in, in the Arab world, or working in with folks in China or in Japan out of this same framework. And so I didn't expect that this framework would travel like that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, the mm -hmm. fall, fall course I, I teach here on public narrative, we have 140 students from 40 countries. And so you begin to get that there are human continuities mm -hmm. and human questions like the Hillel questions that we grapple with. So then, how do we address those? How do we deal with them? Well, it used to be that we had to go talk to each other. Mm -hmm. uh, then we could call each other. Well, it's not it's okay. It's not quite so good. Um, then we could um, sort of signal to each other. Now, what's happening over this time is that the form of communication is becoming less and less and less relationally embedded. Mm -hmm. 
And so, you know, it's not too surprising that social media is kind of a crazy thing because it's not two people communicating with all the empathetic dimensions mm-hmm. that both inhibit and facilitate communication when two people are talking mm-hmm. like we are. Mm-hmm. It's reducing a human being to a symbol, which is a word or a brand, and then throwing it at each other. Yeah. So the, the, both the bridges and the constraints that are there in normal communication aren't. Mm-hmm. And we get some pretty destructive stuff. Yeah. The other thing is that we're then tempted to try to find shortcuts. Like, well, we don't really need to have a meeting. Let's just uh, find out. Everybody can just log on and mm-hmm. say what they think. Mm-hmm. And then we'll just aggregate everybody's views. And then we'll have a, a solution. Mm-hmm. It's all an algorithm. Yeah. Except that nobody participated in the process of learning. Nobody decided to own that. Mm-hmm. And so we confuse aggregation of individual input with the creation of collective capacity. Mm-hmm. And they're qualitatively different. Mm-hmm. And collective capacity is what's needed for a democracy to work mm-hmm. or for a community to work. So, yeah, there's been all kinds of changes, mm-hmm. but also in some ways they've been destructive. They pose new challenges. I mean, one reason I find it interesting to connect to the Media Lab is to, is to experience this stuff mm-hmm. and then figure out how so how do you how do you engage all this in the service of agency and of humanity as opposed to being being um, instrumentalized by it yeah and the fact of the whole shift to neoliberal economics mm-hmm. you know going back to the 60s and 70s just has overlap with that to sort of radically individualize everything mm-hmm. and hold up the market as the core model for human interaction. Mm-hmm. And markets do not build collective capacity, mm-hmm. and they sure have nothing to do with equality. Mm-hmm. Um, Sid Verba, who taught uh, government here for many years, used to say that liberal democracy is a, it's a, it's a gamble whether uh, equality of voice can balance inequality in resources. Mm -hmm. And uh, government is the main mechanism through which equality of voice can be expressed. Mm -hmm. Because markets are not about equality, they're about allocation of resources based on resources. And so the sort of assault on government these last 40 years and the undermining of democratic practice and the illusion, oh, that can just be substituted with Facebook or something, I think that's a real challenge, and I think that's what creates the conditions for a Trump, because, and Carl Polanyi wrote this in 1941, trying to understand where fascism came from Mm -hmm. in Europe. Mm -hmm. His conclusion was that after World War I, the radical open marketness, uh, it was like, he says, when price captures value, a market works, Mm -hmm. but when value is not capturable in price, like a life, like education, like faith, and you try to reduce it to price, then you commodify everything and you savage it and you create the context for a pathological response to the need to belong and connect and find meaning. And so, you know, I sort of, the interaction of the technology with the uh, the market stuff has really presented us with some enormous challenges. And, you know, for me, the, the positive thing is that you know, in the work I do in, in in our distance learning class, for example, the typical people in that are maybe thirty some, and they're try they're rooted in different cultures, but they're trying to reclaim the human mm-hmm. uh, in 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 their countries in the system, and I think that's where we are here. We got to rec- reclaim our humanity. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I think, as you, I mean, there's a lot of juicy things in there, and I think that there's, uh, I think, I mean, I just want to highlight a couple from the end. A, the agency and humanity versus being instrumentalized by it, yes. like, ooh. And then another version of that kind of is taking things that are traditionally not, where the price and the value aren't the same, and yes. then trying to price them, and it just commodifies them, and that's sad. That is so important. Yeah, those both of those are key. Um, yeah. And I think that the... Uh, 
I, this this interesting piece here about um, you were describing something kind of like slacktivism where you're just like, oh, as long as we just aggregate all of the input, yeah. that's pretty much equal to yeah. collective capacity. It's like, no, 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 those no. are different. And I'm reminded of, um, in Zeynep Tufekci's um, right. book, Twitter and Teargas, where it's like the difference between your is your ability to signal to people, like get people in the same place for a little bit of time or to just like, you know, everybody posts like on Facebook or whatever, right. that versus the long-term capacity building and governance building that you get. Yeah. Those are the two very different things, and the internet only enabled the first one without really enabling the second one. Well, because of how it's been used. Mm -hmm. In other words, I think that I love this distance learning classes I teach. We're starting another, you know, this one in public narrative. Because we can do things there is no way we could have done. Mm -hmm. Uh, We started an Arabic version this this year uh, out of Amman uh, for for organizing distance learning all in Arabic. And there were 38 spots and uh, 400 applications. And they wound up admitting uh, people from 11 countries who then formed connections or relationships with each other. There, there's no other way they could do it. So to me, the, the, the problem, we are so gifted at developing new ways to enhance our power, you know, like this technology. But when it comes to the moral and political capacity to use it, we're behind the curve. And, you know, it's amazing we didn't blow ourselves up with the... So my concern is how to develop the moral and political capacity not to stop the tech, but to use them in a way that enhances our humanity rather than diminishing it. And and I think that's kind of where where, where we're at right yeah. now. Yeah, I agree. I think that's what we need. I think maybe the, my final kind of question here as we wrap, and just uh, so I'm going to ask a question about cryptocurrency and blockchain stuff. Oh, yeah. just, just for our users, to, or for our yeah. listeners to be clear, Marshall is not an expert in this or you know has very, very little. Um, but I want, I want to kind of claim something and, then, right, and then see what you think of, about it. So, cool. so the macro vibe kind of is that, um, so, in something like like what you're saying, or in Zeynep's book, Twitter and Tear Gas, that you have um, you have capacity. So, you, so you have signaling versus capacities, yeah. um, and the signaling ability to like come together for a quick bit or whatever versus the long term capacity building, movement building, right. and that the internet really was able to um, uh, really catalyze this ability. To but before, it was hard to get a bunch of people to. It was right. like, oh man, we can just make a Facebook event and boom, we, before long, a ton of people into here. Square. Radically reduce the cost. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, the friction yeah. is so much lower, and so that is. Uh, interesting, but it was kind of fragile because it didn't have right. um, the long-term capacity and governance building. And my claim is that um, you could see something like cryptocurrency and blockchain technology as um, the thing that kind of enables is kind of like the technology to enable that long-term capacity and governance building because it has kind of money baked into it. So for as an example here, it's like so as the internet was to information as blockchain and crypto is to value and money. And so if you think about value and money, and you think about something like Bitcoin, it was just like uh, a uh, a paper was put on the internet in 2009, and then a bunch of people started to get into it, and more and more people started to get into it, and then that thing had to kind of learn how to govern itself um, because there was money involved, and also because there was money involved, it allowed that thing to perpetuate itself instead of kind of falling back into the system in a fragile way. Um, so, <laughs> does that, what do you... What are your hot? What's your well, thought on that? Let, hot me, take, yeah. let me just say that I have never thought of it that way. <laughs> I think it's fascinating. No, no, really. I, I, it's very interesting because, no, I think I think the cool thing about the, these kinds of conversations is, you, 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 oh, that's really. <laughs> yeah, that's interesting. I would never thought of that. Mm-hmm. I guess, but my initial question yeah. is, you're still stuck in economic value. Yes. Yeah. And, and economic value is economic value, and the values that are under assault here yep. are not economic yep. values. Yep. They're, the, they're, they're, they're the humanity, they're, they're moral values, yep. they're education, health, all of this. So I guess the question is, how can our capacity to assert those values be strengthened? Yep, yep. I think that that's a great question and a great pushback, and that's and you can see that also within the cryptocurrency world. It's just like because it's all money based, like yeah. most of what's happening is speculation and scams and all yeah, this like yeah. kind of rampant whatever. I think that there's a the hope is that 
um, for someone like me, and for a lot of people in the, like, I have enough at this point. Like, my economic value, like, yeah. I, I self-tax myself 20% of my wealth. It's like, give that, because I have enough. Yeah. I've essentially, the economic value for me is done. You can kind of imagine the blockchain crypto world. It's like, abstracting the concept of economic value such that more and more people can get it such that then more people are allowed to focus on the kind of moral piece. That's the hope. Um, I, guess, I don't know. Yeah. No, and I guess my, <laughs> my hope is that we are able to focus on the political and moral and yeah. enough to be a, to enable that sort of thing to happen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, because things are pretty tough right now. Yeah, yeah. And so, I, you know, I think there's a... It's a big difference between hope and optimism. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, optimism like, hey, everything's going to be good. Uh, hope is much more realistic. It mm-hmm. was Maimonides who defined hope as belief in the plausibility of the possible, mm-hmm. as opposed to the necessity of the probable. In other words, mm-hmm. in other words, to be a realist is to recognize that we live in a world where it is always probable Goliath will win, mm-hmm. but sometimes David does. Mm-hmm. Uh, that we, it was improbable we elect a black man president of this country, and we did. There's this sense of possibility as opposed to probability. And I think we live in a world where both are operative. For me, that's a source of hope, without necessarily being optimistic. Mm -hmm. And I think think that's the place we need to be. Um, You know, we did this project with David Kong and the the biotech hackers thing. That's been really fascinating. Yeah. And that was an exercise that first it was going to be an aggregation around a common interest, but it turned into an actual process of determining their, their shared purpose. Yeah. It's just so different. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I agree. I think, um, uh, so I guess with that, this is to say, we'll see what happens with blockchain and crypto over time. Um, we're out of time. So, Marshall, what, uh, for people on the, um, the listeners, how should they learn more about you or, or any, any call to actions for them? Um, well, they can, they can certainly come to our website. We have a network, Leading Change Network, that couples the efforts of people all over the world in, with this kind of approach. Uh, and, uh, and then we have our distance learning classes. And there's people we work with all over the all over the place who are doing this sort of work. Mm-hmm. Through the network, it's it's a lot easier to kind of find them. Yeah. So we'd encourage people to um, yeah to you know engage with us. Yeah, tap into that network. Yeah, yeah and mm-hmm. spread you know just share this. Yeah, learners become teachers. That's kind of how this thing goes. Yeah, totally. Yeah, and, and I guess one other thing that I'd say to my listeners is if you're um, if you're doing too much of the mental, um, really, you know, check back in with your emotional and your story of self and, and the narrative. So Amen. that's the other piece. Amen. Uh, well, with that, thank you so much uh, for coming on today, Marshall. Thanks, Ruth. This was really fun. It was fun, yeah. yeah thanks okay. a lot. Is it, do I say is it is it Gans Marshall yeah. Gans? Okay, yeah. sweet. Just wanted to make yeah, sure. That's right. Good. Um, cool. You ready to rock? Reese, Reese exactly. Thank okay. you. Like Sorry, Reese Y S is. It's kind of a weird spell. Yeah. Well, it, no. It's, I mean, I see that name. What is it? Welsh? Or? It's Welsh. Nice. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It's, Seemed like it would be Welsh. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And my mom liked the way that the H and the Y are yeah. 180 degree rotational <laughs> symmetry from each other. So. No, no, that's cool. <laughs> no, that's interesting. Do you know what its meaning is in Welsh? I, it means king. Um, well, that's pretty good. It's not bad. Yeah, it's not okay. bad. I think. Yeah. <laughs> note here is that this kind of podcast it really feels nice to me and i think i might do more of these in the future where i really dive into the human side understand people's story of self story of us story of now that's nice it feels good instead of kind of my hyper mental systemic view it's nice to be connected to the emotional human piece more often so i think it's likely that i do more interviews like this one uh and one thing to note here is that you know, for the story of uh, self, story of us, story of now, there's kind of two two funny things with this. One is, I mean, I think it's very powerful what Marshall talks about in terms of, you know, giving people agency, giving people hope instead of just reacting out of fear. I think that mindset, that primitive being like, when change happens, how do we give people agency and hope instead of fear? I think that's a crucial mindset to have. And the other piece here is, I think this is... You know, he talks about the articulation of moral sources. 
as, you know, when one is telling their story and you say, oh, here's when this happened to me, here's this happened to me, and having moments as the core unit, I think that's another crucial idea, which is instead of telling story, instead of talking about systems as a way to convince people of things or whatever, instead using something like moments as a core unit of, of the narrative that you're shaping. So, so I think that those are just two kind of underlying primitives that I'll hopefully take with me um, as I think about storytelling going forward. Uh, and I'll try my own story of uh, stealth, story of us, story of now at the end of this. Um, before I do, I just want to talk a little bit about the tech side for a second. One is, yeah, I mean, uh, as Marshall notes, um, People are taking shortcuts with tech in terms of organizing where they will, you know, just survey folks instead of, you know, holding a meeting or whatever. And he says that, you know, this conflates aggregation of individual input with the creation of collective capacity. And I think that's super true. And I think that it's, you know, from the perspective, as I noted in the show, you can, A, you can map that into the Tufeki signal versus capacity framework where you say, hey, you know, when people are just signaling to each other, um, that is fragile versus this building of collective capacity that allows for anti-fragility and resilience. And our current forms of tech don't do as much of that, or we're not using them for that as much. Um, it, it reminds me, it's, it feels just like a better is worse thing. Where we're like, oh, this is actually better. Sweet. Um, we can just aggregate individual input. And they're like, uh, it actually turns out it was worse because we're not actually creating the collective capacity that we used to. So um, that's, I think, a crucial point with the tech. And then this other one is, you know, as Marshall notes, I try to push the crypto idea as network nonviolent protest. And he says, hey, he kind of pushes back and says, we're still stuck in these, you know, that is from the perspective of economics and economic values. Um, and, and the values that are under assault are not economic. So how do we strengthen those? Um, it feels like crypto is kind of not even addressing that question. And oof, I mean, <laughs> I don't really know the answer to this question. I know I'm reading about it. Uh, there's a great book by Albert Hirschman, which I just finished, called The Passions and the Interests, which is kind of a philosophical uh, curated synthesis uh, on why markets uh, rose to prominence um, as a, it, kind of the argument for why for why markets were good for society. Um, thinking about Adam Smith and um, uh, Tocqueville and um, uh, a variety of other philosophers, so I can't remember their names right now. That idea, um, and, and this idea that um, having commerce allows people to follow our interests um, while mitigating our passions and vices, that, that was a macro claim back then. And so, yeah, I don't know, that feels very related, this overlap of, of political and economic stuff um and the conflation of those two things it feels that feels like a juicy space to explore and really i i do think that there is um if we want to get people to be unstuck from economic values giving them abundance allows them to uh say oh i have enough with economics now i can focus more on you know these other values or whatever so yeah that's my initial take but i think it's a very good question from marshall